All right, so 1.3, we're going to talk about average rates of change. Now, from 112, what do we know about average rates of change? Absolutely nothing. What's another way of saying average rate of change? What's another word that is more commonly used? Slope, right. Average rate of change. Miles per hour is a rate of change, right? I'm going 14 miles per hour. That's just a slope. 14 miles for every one hour, rise over run. Okay, so average rate of change is another way of saying slope. So we want to compute average rates of change. We want to find simplified difference quotients. And if you remember the difference quotient from 112, which was the f of x plus h minus f of x over h, that everybody was like, oh, this sucks. Why are we doing this? And, well, it's because you need it in calculus. Okay. So average rate of change of y with respect to x is just the change in y divided by the change in x. That's what rate of change is. But if you look at this, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, like I said, that's just the slope formula, right? Only difference here, well, not even really the difference here, but uh, we know that x2 can't be x1 or we get zero in the denominator, which would be an undefined slope, okay? That means your independent variable is not changing. All right? So if we look at the graph of a function, we can look at y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. These are two points on the graph. It doesn't matter that the line is, or the graph is not linear. Uh, we're talking about any function. It could be as curvy and wavy as you want it to be. But if we look at two points, we'll call them P and Q, and give those x1, y1, x2, y2. The average rate of change is just the slope of the line that's connecting those two points. Okay? So if we talk about, say, if I'm driving to Mobile, it's about 350 miles from Athens to Mobile, you know, roughly. Uh, say I do the first hour at 50 miles an hour, the next hour at 70 miles an hour, the next hour at you know, 45 mile an hour because I hit a uh, construction zone, you know, all the, the entire trip I'm not going one constant speed, right? However, if I look at the entire trip, how long it took and how far I went, I can get an average of how much I went, how, what my speed was. But that average is not, it doesn't tell me anything about the exact moment in time, but it does tell me the average. Okay, and that's what we're doing here. We're looking at the beginning and the ending, and I don't know, I don't care what happened in the middle, I'm just going to connect those two points and find an average, okay? So, notice that the line connecting them, it intersects that function in two points, and that's called a secant line, okay? S-E-C-A-N-T. This is one of the aspects of calculus that we're, we focus on as secant lines. The other is tangent lines. The tangent line only touches at one point as opposed to touching at two points, okay? Now, if we want to find the rate of change of a function, say the function is x squared, we need to know where we're going to and where we're starting from. So we always need an x1 and a y1. So we're saying x is changing from 1 to 3. 1 is where we started, 3 is where we ended. So 3 is automatically the x2 because we x2 is always where we end and x1 is where we begin. So we can say here that x1 is 1 and x2 is 3. Now if y is equal to x squared, how do you think we find y1? We plug in x1 into our function, right? If x1 is 1, then it's going to be f of 1 basically. So we're looking at f of x1, which is 1 squared, or just 1. Same deal with y2. It's going to be f of x2, right? We're just plugging in the value of x2, so we get 3 squared, which is 9. Now, since we're saying that this is average rate of change is just the slope, we've got x1, y1, we've got x2, y2, we can just use our slope formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, 
will give us 9 minus 1 over 3 minus 1, which is going to give us a rate of change of 4. So for every one change in x, I have four changes in y. Okay? It's just a slope, rise over run. That makes sense. Maybe not the application of it or the practicality of it, but at least how to do it. That's what's important at this point. Okay? What about if x changes from 1 to 2? Does anything change in our problem in terms of how we do it? Now, we're still talking about going from one point to another point, okay? So we're going to say, for this one, the only thing that changes is now that x2 is 2. So we got 2 squared, which gives us 4. So we've got 4 minus 1, 2 minus 1, which gives us 3 over 1, which is 3. Notice from any value of x to the next value of x, you're probably going to have a different rate of change. With x squared, if you look at the graph of x squared, that's a parabola. If we go from, you know, 1 to 2, we can see that that's, you know, there's a specific rate of change there. The further out I go, the steeper that rate of change is. Because x squared is, you know, it's almost exponential. It's not an exponential function, but it's, it's squared, so you can see that it rises really sharply. So that means that that rate of change is going to get higher the further out you go, which makes sense because any two points will have a bigger slope. Okay? Two to three will give you just an even bigger slope, a bigger change. We don't actually have to do it. All right, so what we want to do is we want to state the average rate of change for each situation in a short sentence, including units. So if it rained four inches over a period of eight hours, how do we express that as a rate of change? Half an inch per hour, right? Because you do four inches over eight hours, simplify it, you get one half. So that gives you one half inch per hour. Does that make sense? car travels 250 miles on 20 gallons of gas. What is it? Twelve and a half, what? Miles per gallon. Because you're going to set that up as 250 miles for 20 gallons. Okay? So, 25 divided by 2. At 2 p.m., the temperature was 82 degrees. At 5 p.m., the temperature was 76 degrees. So what's going on here? So how much have we changed? Six degrees in how many hours? In three hours. Do we go up or down? Temperature went down, right? So we went down 6 degrees. 6 divided by 3. So we have a negative 2 degrees per hour. So we have temperatures decreasing by 2 degrees every hour. Okay? All right, so let's do 
B real quick. So I want y'all to work B out and tell me what the answer is. Y'all don't have, well, I didn't bring the paddles in here because I knew we were going to have the active shooter. So just work it out and then shout it out. Or actually, it should be, you should be able to give it to me in your, on your fingers. So give me the answer on your fingers. But you knew that. Yes. All right, so we're going to say y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Well, I know my x2 and my x1 are 2 minus 1. What about y2 and y1? y2, we're going to plug x2 in, so we get 2 cubed which is 8. Y1, we're going to plug 1 in. We get 1 cubed. It's 1. So 8 minus 1, we get 7 over 1. Okay? Now, the average rate of change of f with respect to x is also called the difference quotient. We've done this before. Uh, we're talking about h now because we're talking about x moving h units away. So if, if this point is x, if we add h to it, some random h, then we get x plus h, okay? Which means that the y value associated with x is f of x. This is the y associated with x. The y associated with x plus h is f of x plus h, right? So if we look at these points, x, f of x, x plus h, and f of x plus h, then we get the slope of that line is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Notice that the x's just cancel out on the bottom, and you just that's why you wind up with just that h. Oh, it's only a test, but everybody hide. I've got to figure out how to pause this. Hold on. I would not do this normally. Okay, so back to where we are at. And oh, there's my pen. Okay, so our difference quotient is just a direct result of we're finding the slope of these secant points, okay? So we want to find the difference quotient when x equals 5 and h equals 3. Oh, yeah, y'all might want to see that, huh? Sorry. 
just imagine, if you will, come in here, that is going to be something that I mentioned because that was, I we couldn't hear that. So, oh yeah, let me go ahead and give you all these. I would like to thank you for participating in the lockdown drill. Uh, we would like your feedback. If you could go to this website and tell them what you thought of the drill. And exactly. But if this, I, I guess this is the idea that if he smashes the windows in and has to put his arm in, that maybe somebody will go over there and grab his arm and fight him. You know, because it's the run, hide, fight thing. So if, if you can't hide anymore, you got to fight. See, the, the only problem I have with doing that, and I thought about doing that, but if you put the table up there, he's going to know you're in here. Because why else would there be, a, a, you know, <laughs> something up against there? So. Well. Maybe he'll think we already got out. Somebody warned us. That's yeah. That's that's one of the the things that they tell you in the big course that you go to. That that's one of the best things you can do is secure that to keep it from opening. But we're talking about doing like a blind there or something that would stay closed all of the time. Generally, uh, we could open them if we wanted to, but that way. They would be closed, and if you came through, he'd not, well, it's closed, it's always closed, so what difference does it make? He wouldn't know somebody was in here. I keep saying he, like only men can shoot people. It could be a woman. I don't want to be sexist. Okay, so. Yes, she did. And did, did anybody go to UAH at that time? I, I was at UAH, I was a student then, and uh, I was on campus that day in a different building. And, uh, ooh, you want to talk about some freaked out family members, let me tell you, calling me, are, are you alive? You know, and I was alive. <laughs> I did know her, though, and she was uh, brilliant. I, there, there are two instructors over there that have been charged with murder, uh, Amy Bishop and uh, Dr. Pakamov, who killed his wife, uh, allegedly. He was charged with it, and he's in jail. But that dude, super brilliant. He was on the forefront of laser research in physics. The stuff he was doing, nobody else in the country was doing. That's one of the reasons it was so tragic that he, other than the fact that he actually killed somebody, I mean, but his work was just amazing. Her, yeah, I could give or take her work because it's not in physics or math, but uh, she, was, she was a really smart person too. And both of them came and talked to my um, my first year course where we do like a survey of, of uh, fields and things like that. So they both came and I, I got to meet and, and interact with both of them. And I was like, maybe we need to change who we're inviting to these seminars because that's, but anyway, that has nothing to do with anything. You know it's easy to get me off topic. Legally, no. Le legally, there's really not anything that the college can do. It, there, there are all these things posted about weapons on campus, but legally, the only thing they can do is ask you to leave. You can't be arrested for bringing a gun on campus. To bring it on campus? That would be easily overturned. It may be a felony, but it's it's a right that we have. And generally, it's considered if you if you show up somewhere that's posted, and this I mean this has been challenged in other states. If you show up somewhere that's posted no firearms, the only thing they can do is charge you with trespassing if you refuse to leave. But that being said, don't bring your guns to school. But I guarantee you, there's somebody in this building right now that has a weapon on them. Oh, that's not an employee that doesn't work for the college. Because people, I mean, there are women that carry in their purses, you know. There'll be men that carry concealed, and you just don't know it. You know, 
there are off-duty cops that bring theirs, you know, things like that. So there are people here that have them, whether that's good or bad. You know, it's totally up to you to make up your own mind. I'm not going to tell you, but you know, I'm a big proponent of training employees, you know, and letting certain employees conceal carry. I have no issue with that as long as they have proper training. That's just me. I have proper training though, so I would be happy to carry. <laughs> Which is odd because my wife won't even let me keep shells in the house for the shotguns. Don't ask. It's a whole other argument, but I'll tell you this, as more people start breaking and entering and mass shootings and things like that, she's like, I think it might be time to get some bullets. She calls them bullets. I'm like, shells, baby. It's a shotgun. But anyway, back to math. Like I said, it's easy to get me sidetracked, right? All right. So for f of x equals x squared, find the difference quotient when x equals 5 and h equals 3. So how are we going to do this? Well, let's just do the difference quotient, right? f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So f of x plus h just means we're going to take f of x and plug x plus h anywhere there's an x. So that's x plus h squared, which if we fold that out, gives us x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Okay, so then we plug that in down here. F of x plus h is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Subtract f of x, which is just x squared, over h. The x squareds will cancel out. 2xh plus h squared over h. We can factor an h out of the top. This is with 2x plus h. Those h's cancel out, and we just get 2x plus h. So there's our difference quotient. So how do we get our actual value? Well, we've got x and h, right? So 2 times x plus h is 13. Now, a different way of doing this that doesn't quite use the difference quotient, if x is 5 and h is 3, what is x2? Remember on our picture, if this is x, the distance to the next point, x plus h, this is h. So what is x2 going to be? x plus h. 5 plus 3, or 8. So x2 equals 8. So now we can just do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, because we've got all of our points, right? So if x1 is 5, 5 squared is 25. So y1 is 25. y2 is going to be 8 squared, or 64. We've got 64 minus 25 over 8 minus 5, or what is that? 39 over 3, which equals 13. Which is not a, I mean, there's no reason not to do that. If that's the easier for you than using the difference quotient. So, is a method we can use. That's basically what they're doing. Changing it into y2 minus y1 over h, basically. Okay? How do I do that?
All right, so all we learned in this section was what that difference quotient, how it really is just a rate of change, and how rate of changes are all just slopes. Okay? Nothing huge in this section other than that. That's the most important thing to get from that section. Okay? Any questions on that? All right, let's do the next section. So now what we want to do is we're going to look at differentiation using the limit of the different quotient, the difference quotient. Now the beauty of this is we already know how to do derivatives, right? So we can always check our answers because we know what the derivative is going to be. Now, we've talked about average rate of change as the slope of the secant line. Okay, average rate of change is slope of secant line. Now we want to talk about the instantaneous rate of change. Almost any time you see the word instantaneous in mathematics, physics, chemistry, things like that, you're almost always going to be talking about taking a derivative, okay? Because it's going to give us a value that's not an average, but the value at a specific point. So we can look at the instantaneous rate of change of the function at a value. We can find that by taking the limit as h approaches 0 of the difference quotient. Now, remember, the difference quotient is just the slope of the secant line, right? But what happens as h gets smaller and smaller? x and x x1 and x2 approach each other, right? If x is really small, then that area between them is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So the limit as x approaches 0 just means that those points are getting closer and closer together. We no longer have a secant line. We're going to have a tangent line because those points are going to come together. Okay? So we call this the slope of the tangent line when we take the limit as h approaches 0. So notice, if we look at this graph, at q1, we have that secant line. At q2, we have that secant line. At q3, we have that secant line. At q4, we have this secant line. Notice that we're getting closer and closer to just having this tangent line at P. They're all approaching that tangent line. If we take the limit here, as H approaches 0, we get that tangent line. This is the definition of derivative. We didn't worry about the definition of the derivative before we learned it, but that's all it is. The derivative is just the limit as h approaches 0 of the difference quotient. That is something I'll want you to know. Okay, This is an important aspect of calculus. This is the heart of derivation. I will give you a problem and tell you to work it out, doing it, taking the derivative using the limit. Of course, you'll know the answer because you already know how to do derivatives. So you should be able to check your answer. Okay? But on the test, there will be at least one problem that specifically says to do it this way. Okay? So as long as this derivative exists, we say the function is differentiable. No one ever calls f prime the derived function. It says they do, but I don't know that I've ever heard that. Okay? So let's take it and say, for example, f of x is x squared. We want to find the derivative of f of x. What is the derivative of f of x? 2x. So we know f prime is 2x. So we're going to use that to check our answer. So we want to take the limit of the difference quotient. So we're going to take x plus h and plug it 
into x squared, we get x plus h squared minus f of x, which is x squared. So when we do this, we get the limit as h approaches 0 of x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus x squared over h. Now notice we can't just plug in h equals 0, right, because it's in the denominator. So we have to work that whole thing out so that we can cancel the h out. So the x squareds will cancel. We've got the limit as h approaches 0 of 2xh plus h squared over h. We factor the h out. We cancel the h out. Now we've just got the limit as h approaches 0 of 2x plus h. This is a polynomial, right? There's no reason that I can't just plug that value of h in. So if I plug in h equals 0, what's my limit? It's just 2x, right? Which I knew I should get. So this is the kind of problem that you want to look at and be prepared to do on the test. Be aware that with the difference quotient, our f of x should always cancel out, and we should always be able to factor an h out of the top so that it cancels with the bottom. And then we're just plugging in h equals 0 into our final limit. Also, I want you to be aware that I will want you to do this when you're solving. Notice that I went from here to here to here to here to here, okay? What I want you to notice is I have the limit as h approaches 0 in front of each one of these, okay? If I just wrote equals and then just did the 2xh plus h squared over h without the limit, that's not true. That limit is not equal to just that rational function. Make sure you put the limit on each step or else it's not true, okay? I know that's nitpicky, but it's one thing that I am nitpicky about. All right, now it says to find the, the f prime of negative 3 and f prime of 4. So how do we do that? Right, you're just plugging those x's in, right? So what's f prime of negative 3? 2 times negative 3 is negative 6, yes. And then f prime of 4, 2 times 4 is 8. So now I have x cubed. A little more challenging because it's a cube. What's the derivative of x cubed? So I know f prime is just 3x squared, so we'll use that to check our answer. So when we plug in x plus h into x cubed, we get x plus h cubed minus f of x, which is x cubed, over h. So x plus h cubed is going to give us x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3xh squared plus h cubed. If you don't have the formula memorized for a cube, how would we do that? We just say x plus h squared times x plus h, fold that out, and then have to multiply it by x plus h again. So if we follow that, we get x squared plus 2xh plus 2xh plus h squared times x plus h again. Collect like terms, x squared 
plus 4x. No, I can't multiply. It's not 2xh, it's just xh. So that'll be 2xh plus h squared. And then to do a trinomial times a binomial, you just distribute each one. So x squared times x is x cubed. x squared times h is x squared h. 2xh times x is 2x squared h. 2xh squared. xh squared. h cubed. And then combine your like terms. We've got x cubed x squared h plus 2x squared h gives us 3x squared h. 2xh squared plus x h squared gives us 3xh squared. And then plus h cubed. Okay. x plus h cubed is not x cubed plus h cubed. Okay. I saw that a lot on the previous test where people would do squares like that x plus h squared is not x squared plus h squared. You can't just do each one separately. Make sure you FOIL it out, okay? So now we subtract f of x, which is x cubed, all over h. So the x cubed cancels out. We've got 3x squared h plus 3xh squared plus h cubed over h. So we can factor the h out. Gives us 3x squared plus 3xh plus h squared over h. The h's cancel out. And I've just got the limit as h, h approaches 0 of 3x squared plus 3xh plus h squared, which is a, a polynomial. So I can just plug h equals 0 in. That goes to 0. That goes to 0. And I just get 3x squared. OK? So if you're ever doing these and you get a different answer down here than you did for your derivative, you know you've done something wrong. So check it. Check your work. See if you can find your error because they're easy to make in these difference quotients. So now for all of the people that were taking 112 going, why do we have to learn difference quotient? Here it is. This is the application of the limit, or of the uh, difference quotient. You have to take the limit. And you get the derivative, OK? Any questions on that? All right, if I gave you this problem and said, find the derivative of f of x equals x cubed plus x squared, and then calculate f prime of negative 2 and f prime of 4, there would be no reason to use the limit process, right? Because you know how to take the derivative of x cubed plus x squared. However, if I were to tell you that you had to, that would suck. I wouldn't give you one like this. More than likely for the test, you'll see something along the lines of f of x equals, you know, 3x plus 4, and that's it. I probably won't even give you a quadratic, you know. So I'm not going to give you a cube because they just can get really cumbersome and wield, unwieldy. So just be prepared to do a simple binomial using the limit process, okay? Which one? Okay, so you know you want to do f of x plus h, which is going to be 3 times x plus h plus 4, which is 3x plus 3h plus 4. 
and then do f of x plus h minus f of x, 3x plus 3h plus 4 minus 3x plus 4. So the 3x and the 3x will cancel out. 4 minus 4 will cancel out, and you'll just have 3h. So you'll wind up with the limit as h approaches 0 of 3h over h. The h's will cancel out, so you have the limit as h approaches 0 of 3, which is Three, which we know because the derivative of 3x plus h or plus 4 is 3. Okay? All right, let's do this one, but we're going to do it the way we know how to do it. So what's, what's the derivative of 3 over x? negative 3 over x squared. Right, because this is just 3x to the negative 1. So we multiply by the exponent times 3, get negative 3. Subtract 1 from the exponent, we get x to the negative 2, which is just 1 over x squared. So what's f prime of 2? So what we want to do is we want to be able to find the equation of the tangent line to that curve at x equals 2. Well, this sounds super complicated. Is it super complicated? It's not, I promise. What do we need to be able to find an equation of a line? We need the slope, and we need a point, right? So what's the slope of the tangent line? By definition, we just defined it. It's the derivative, right? So slope of tangent line is the derivative. So this slope is negative 3 over x squared. Well, when x is 2, we just get negative 3 fourths, right? it's always going to give you an x value. So we've got our slope. How do we find our point? In what value? In what? Say so plug it in. We only need one point but we're given the x value. So how are we going to find the y value? Just plug that x back into the original function, and that should give you the y value associated with that x value. So. find that y1, you just plug the x back into the original function. And that's going to give us 3 halves. So now we've got a point, 
we've got the slope, can we make a line out of a point in the slope? Yes, we can, using point-slope form. Does anybody remember point-slope form? Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1. So, Y1 is 3 halves, M is negative 3 fourths, X1 is 2. So we distribute. We get negative 3 fourths X. Negative times a negative is going to give us positive. 3 fourths times 2, it's like a fraction, so we do across the top. 3 times 2 is 6. 4 times 1 is 4. We get 6 fourths, but 6 fourths can be simplified. What's that going to become? It's going to be 3 halves. We want to get y by itself, so we add 3 halves. What's 3 halves plus 3 halves? 3. So there's the equation of the line tangent to that curve at the point x equals 2. There will be a problem like this on the test where I ask you to find the equation of a tangent line. All right. something important and probably the last thing that we'll talk about. Where are functions not differentiable? Well, a point is not, a function isn't differentiable anywhere there's a corner. Okay? And when we say that, we're talking about points as opposed to smooth curves. If something drastically changes at that point, it has no tangent line, okay? Remember, tangent line means we only touch it at one point. Well, that line is tangent there, isn't it? That line is tangent to that point as well, as is that one, that one. Those curves have an infinite amount of tangent lines, so we can't really say that this is the slope of that tangent line. That's why it's not differentiable. Same way here. That's a tangent line, that's a tangent line, that's a tangent line. Okay? So anywhere there's a corner, it's not differentiable. If there is a point of vertical tangency, it's also not uh, differentiable. So notice that the only tangent line at this point is vertical. That means it's not differentiable there. Because what's the slope of a vertical tangent line? Not zero. Undefined. Therefore, if that slope is undefined, then the, different, the uh, derivative would have to be undefined. Okay. If it's not continuous, it's not differentiable. Why? Because the limit from this direction gives us a different value of the limit from this direction. And those limits have to be the same.
All right, so where is the function absolute value of x plus 6 not differentiable and why? Anybody got any ideas? At x equals some value, that function is not differentiable. If we were to graph it, let me help you out. It'll look like that. So at x equals negative 6, there's a sharp turn. Therefore, it is not differentiable at x equals negative 6. Okay? If you do not have your basic shapes of graphs down and, and how to translate them, you might want to look back over some of my 112 videos, but uh, this is a basic graph translated to the left. We should be able to look at it and tell where that point is at. Okay. So tangent line is a line that touches a smooth curve, not a point uh, or a corner at a single point. We call that the point of tangency. Uh, and the derivative of the function is defined as the limit as h approaches 0, not x, of f of x plus h minus f of x over h, that difference quotient. The slope of the tangent line is the derivative at that point, and those slopes are interpreted as instantaneous rate of change. The equation of the tangent line can be found by using the fact that m is the slope of the tangent line and the point can be found however you need to find it by plugging the x1 in. Uh, and if a function is differentiable, then it is continuous at that point. Since we knew that it's not differentiable where it's not continuous, we know that it is continuous anywhere that it is differentiable. Therefore, differentiability implies continuity. If I can prove it's differential, differentiable, then I proved it's con con continuous. I need to drink. I don't have my water. My mouth's getting gummy. All right. So does anybody have any questions about that? All right. We will do some more limits and do L'Hopital's rule on Monday. I believe then we have a review on Wednesday and the test the following Monday. I think that's right. All right. If anybody has any